I think the early Christians had some things figured out in ways that we've completely lost the narrative on. They had these radical ideas that faced off against the social, political, economic problems they saw in their world in their day. And they were so radical, so groundbreaking, that if we were to apply them today, they would totally change our current world for the better. Hi, my name is Greg Simpson. I'm a minister in the United Church of Canada. You don't have to look far in our news media today to realize that there are parts of this world that are pretty messed up. And those parts generally show up wherever there are humans. We have a fairly strong track record of messing things up. If you've been around here for much time at all, you've probably heard me speak about this theory or philosophy I have that the, the base sin that we address, the base way that makes us distant from God or distant from the best version of who we are, both individually and as a human race, is the sin of selfishness, of putting ourselves way before other people. I'm more than happy to get deep into that conversation. If you think there are different sins that are deeper or more important or a base part of who we are, I would love to hear them. Stick them in the comments below. But I want today for us to look at the Bible from this idea, this lens, this concept that selfishness is one of the roots of the struggles that we as the human race encounter. I want to kind of look at this from two angles. One, I think the selfishness is in fact built into us. If we look at sort of the instinct of who we are, maybe like evolutionarily how humans became who we were, we need to make sure that there are things like we have food and we have shelter and we're taking steps to make sure that the species keeps on going. Like those very basic animalistic sorts of needs. Those are definitely parts of who we are, but those are very individualized and have no care whatsoever for the rest of humanity. But we are a very social group of people. Some of the ways that anthropologists draw lines in the sand as far as time is concerned and say, okay, that's when we sort of became who we are. Like, what does modern humans look like? And the idea that we came together as societies, that we created cultures, those were sort of lines in the sand saying, that's modern society. It's not about this technology or about that technology, it's coming together. And that coming together changes some of those intrinsic details about how we are wired. Suddenly when we're living in communities, it's now as important or sometimes more important to tear, care for the community when compared to our own selves. Now I wanna be clear that this isn't a conversation about self-care. Taking care of yourself is very important. And if you spend all of your life putting everybody else first, that's also a fairly toxic thing for you to do. It's not very healthy for you. I'm talking more about the circumstance where you're not gonna care at all for any other human. What happens to them, whether needs are met, that sort of thing, until all of your wants and needs, you're checking every box, you're having the best house and the best vacation, the best clothes, the best job, the most power, the most prestige, you count first before you talk to anybody else. That's the selfishness that we're addressing today. And in fact, I think that it's wired into us. It's sort of maybe our prehistoric, our primitive brain. It's a part of us that we do have built in and modern humans in societies need to address this. So if you look at our world for a minute, can you find any examples in your life where perhaps people are putting themselves before others? Perhaps there are people or organizations or countries or political structures that are hoarding wealth, power, food, housing, do those situations exist? Okay, so I do lean in on the sarcasm sometimes, but some of these things make me just wild with frustration. So think for yourself about a scenario where that sort of selfishness exists, that corporate greed or political power or fame or fortune or those things are stacked up as more important than meeting the basic needs of food and water and healthcare and housing of 
other humans that we know. What I love about this conversation is none of this is revolutionary. We know these problems exist. We even have a pretty good idea of what we could do to address them. Do you know one of the reasons that we know how to address them? Because the early Christians spoke about it, wrote about it, acted it out. We're talking super early, before they even called themselves Christians. This is just after Pentecost, so we're only talking several months after Jesus' death and resurrection. That's how early we are in this story. So let's jump to Acts 2, and we're going to read 42 to 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came over everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all, as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The word that jumped out there for me was actually the very last word of that entire reading. Those who were being saved. Saved from what is the question I ask. And I think I would like to argue that what they were being saved from was the rampant selfishness that was baked into the culture that they were part of. We must remember this is a time when Jerusalem and the entire Israelite population were under the thumb of the Roman emperor. And we know from history that the Romans were particularly good at making sure the Romans got everything they needed and everybody else, well, either you could pick up the scraps or if you fought too hard, we're just going to kill you off. That was the nature of the Roman Empire. And in a way, it was a very successful way to be. That's part of the reason that the Roman Empire spread across the world. However, that self-same selfishness is also one of the keys to the downfall of that same empire. I don't have time to get deep into the history here. I invite any of you to do some research, to read a book about the history, the rise and the fall of the Roman Empire, and you will see that these elements show up many times. Actually, we can read through this book and we can see that that same style of selfishness was very frequently part of the rise and the fall of the Israelite people too. In fact, once we start looking, we realize that this entire book has a common theme around caring for people who are not you. The ancient Israelites had lots of conversations about the widow, the orphan, and the alien in your land, the people who don't belong there, the people who aren't you. In fact, if we go all the way back to Abraham, which we did only a couple of days ago, Abraham was identified and stood out as being a person who cared for three people that he had never seen before. They were just walking by and he said, I'm going to care for you. This idea of putting others' needs at equal with, with yours, taking the food that you have and sharing with them, taking the water that you have and sharing with them, saying, my friend and stranger, why don't you pause for a minute and take rest in my tent? That's the Abrahamic way. And that is part of what we read as being God reaching out to Abraham and saying, because you are doing such a great job of caring for others in your community, others in your world, I want you to be example for the rest of the world. And each time we see God in covenant with the Israelite people, it has that same shape to it. I want to choose you because of your caring nature. I want to choose you to show the rest of the world what's the best version of who we can be and how we can exist. And it carries through step by step through the Old Testament and we land here once again. Of course, I've just jumped over Jesus, who did so much work doing exactly that, caring for people who were downtrodden, who were outcast from society, who were the voices that were no longer being heard, and then also standing up to both the political leaders and the cultural norms of the time, saying, you see this group of people that you're all ignoring? I'm going to go eat with them as a bit of a flag to say, you forgot about them. You need to not forget about them. Or even more so to say, you have created a society which means that this group of outcasts exist. Change your society. 
Make it so that everybody belongs and nobody is outcast. Can that work in our world today? Can purposely taking on selfishness when we see it, is that possible? I think that the early Christians gave us a pretty beautiful example, a hard one, I'll admit. But what it says is they lived together, they sold possessions, and they made sure that everybody who had needs, their needs were met. Now, that also works better in a microcosm than it does in the big old world. But that being said, it doesn't mean that we can't find ways to call out the corporations, the political structures, the organizations, or even the individuals who hoard wealth and food and water and housing and say, that is no longer acceptable. That might be the way that you are getting wealth, but that is not who we are as a human race anymore. Not sure exactly what that looks like in your world. Perhaps you're not one who has power, but I know for myself, of being white and male and living in Western civilization and being an English speaker and even my height and like there's so many things about who I am that give me the power to have my voice heard. So I need to make sure that I'm using that voice to call out the individuals, the organizations, the political structures, the situations that are wildly selfish. And I'm just going to keep turning back to the early Christians saying, thank you for your model and doing my best to follow their lead. Let's pray. God, we know that we are fighting some piece of our own inner nature when we resist selfishness. There is something deep within us that makes us want to be the best of what we are, stand out just a little more above this person or that person. We want to not only keep up with the Joneses, but we want to be just a little better than them. We want the focus on us for one reason or another. We're going to need your strength, your wisdom, your power, your courage to fight that within ourselves so that we can fight that within the societies we find ourselves in, the societies that we have created. And so we turn to you, we turn to your scriptures, we turn to examples that we find all over the place in scripture and even in modern day of people who have found ways to draw closer to you, to dream the sorts of dreams that you have for humanity, the beautiful version of us being the best of who we are. And God, we're going to step into that fray. We're going to be the ones who stand up to power, stand up to our own selfishness and the selfishness in the society we find around us. Give us that strength, that wisdom, that humility, and that courage. Give us the voice to speak. Give us the hands to work. We pray all of this in the powerful name of your risen son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So who are we as Christians if we don't live that beautiful intention? Who are we? I don't think that's a very strong position of Christianity. They keep saying, me first, you last. Here's the beautiful part of it. Right now, there are like 200 people watching this video all around the world watching right now. Can you imagine for just one second if each one of those 200 people made a little difference where they are? We've got friends watching all across the States. We've got friends in Canada. Those are sort of the close geographical places. But some of you talked about being from New Zealand or South Africa or Spain or Denmark. We've got people in South America. We've got people in Asia. It's all over the place. This message is spreading. We're doing that. Keep doing that. I love you for the ways that you take what we're doing here each morning and then you put it into your lives and you live it out and it makes a difference in the world, in the places where you are. Thank you so much for being beautiful, caring, loving, faithful followers of God. If you've missed any previous daily devotions, you can click over there and there should be a playlist. And if you want to subscribe, you can click up there, there's a button, and then YouTube will let you know when I upload the next video which will be tomorrow morning. I love you all. We'll see you tomorrow.
Bye for now.